Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and welcome to my Q&A session number four. We're back for another Q&A session. Thank you so much for sending in all of the questions. In fact, you sent in too many questions. Back in January 2019, I put out a call for more questions related to fly fishing, fly tying, rod building, and all of you came through again. In fact, you sent so many questions that I had to break it into two videos, Q&A part three, and now Q&A part four. So if you skip number three or the first two, you're more than welcome to go back and listen to those ones, but otherwise, let's move forward. Now for all of the new viewers, I do want to just preface this video by saying that the answers to these questions are really based on my own experiences, my opinions, and my own kind of knowledge and what I've learned in the last 30 years while I've been involved in these great sports. And sometimes it may be different from yours. So for starters, let's kind of start by saying, let's kind of learn from each other. So if there's something that I say that just doesn't quite connect with your own experiences, by all means, mention your experiences and your thoughts and opinions down below in the comments section of this video. Again, so we can learn from each other and just extend the conversation a little bit. If you have any questions specifically for me about these, you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com and I list my email address in the, in the description of every YouTube video that I've ever put out there. So um, by all means, reach out to me that way through social media and once again, thank you for these questions let's start answering them so the first one is from Chris Harkin and he starts out by saying Tim I really enjoy your tying videos and expertise thanks Chris it's very kind to say being new to fly tying only two months I would find it helpful in the various aspects of tying adding a tail wrapping dubbing wrapping a hackle with thread hanging down etc as to where to place hands fingers during some of the quote-unquote moves in tying Sometimes being new to tying, I find my hands getting in the way of each other, uh, the vice, the additional materials, etc., and would like a brief tutorial on how the hands can work together tying a fly. If you have too many questions to field regarding your Q&A, perhaps you could just do a separate optimal hand placement type fly tying video as a future video release. Again, thanks for all you do to help us beginners, Chris. Chris, that's a really great question. and. First of all, welcome to the world of fly tying. You're gonna be addicted just like all the rest of us. So come join the crowd. Next, um, you're talking about being a beginner and the first thing I say is just the notion of the learning curve. I teach a lot of beginners, in fact, in the school where I'm a teacher, as a sixth grade teacher, I also teach a fly fishing club and the first kind of half of that club is dedicated to tying flies that will go on to fish. And I always forget about the learning curve until we start that first class and then it's like they don't know how to put a hook into a vise and thread tension and anything. So um, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, but in, the, in a gist, you're really just trying to train your hands to work together. And it's very difficult for me to say, in this video you place them here and here and here. Sure, there is a step-by-step -step procedure that I could say that you do follow, and you could break it down into a series of steps, but I think it would almost be way too complicated. I mean, whenever I think about learning how to cast a fly and the notion of casting, and I think about some of the trainers and some of those expert fly casters, and they break it down and they try to simplify it into so few steps. And I want to say the same kind of exists in fly tying, but in, in it, kind of in a nutshell, where I think about your hands, there's always a, just a kind of a few situations where your hands will overlap each other. But for the most part, you're trying to kind of keep them out of each other's ways. And whenever I have tools that are sitting on the bench, if I'm going to be using that tool with my right hand, for instance, I'll have it placed accordingly underneath my right hand. So I try not to intentionally reach over my left hand to grab for some of the tools. I like to have them placed accordingly. So I would say start with those things, place all of your tools where you believe that you'll be using them. And then from that point forward, try to always make sure that your hands very rarely cross over one another. If they start crossing over one another, that's where some issues could exist. So I would kind of start there. Um, I won't lie, probably I'm, I'm not gonna do a, an optimal hand placement video. I don't know if I can handle that. Um, maybe reach out to Tim Flagler. I always tell people he's got much better hands than me, so maybe start with him. Um, but the only other thing that I could kind of reflect on is there's a lot of fly tires who like to keep their scissors in their hand and they tie with their scissors just ready at all points and it's just easy for them because it, it eliminates a step. So you may want to consider 
trying that, I can tell you I don't do that. There have been times where I watch other tires and I'm so jealous because it does eliminate that step. So if, if you're early into the game, Chris, and you could start by keeping your scissors in your hand and, and see if you have everything going on and you can kind of keep things organized that way, by all means try it because it may benefit you in the long term. If you're having lots of problems right now with your hands kind of crossing back and forth, don't put those scissors in your hands. You're gonna have scars all over your left hand. So I hope that helps a little bit. And then for anyone watching out there, if you have any other thoughts or comments for Chris, um, please by all means leave them down down below in the comments section of this one. Thanks again, Chris. All right, next question. Hi, Tim, it's Tom Rumor from Bangor, PA, a fellow Pennsylvanian. What do you do with old flies? By that, I mean used flies, damaged or unused. Do you just chuck them, cut them down and retie or retire? Um, I find very time consuming to cut down and try to identify the hook for proper storage. Thanks, see you at the New Jersey show. Um, Tom, New Jersey show, Edison was a blast this year. I hope we connected, I don't remember. Um, in short, to answer your question, it kind of varies. In the past, I kept everything. And I blame one of my grandfathers, his name's Angelo, same as my son. I had two really influential uh, grandfathers that I loved, and in fact, I named my son after both of them. But my grandfather, Angelo, he was a pack rat, and he kept everything. So I kind of blame him for an early portion of my life because whenever I would go through his garage uh, after he passed and we would kind of pull out boxes, he would just have boxes full of nails that were bent because he never knew when he was going to have a use for them. He rarely did. And I was kind of the same way with some of those flies. I would just keep them all and I, I knew someday I would tear them apart and discard them and reuse those hooks and it didn't always happen. So it, it does vary with each fly, but in short, if it's an older fly with um, a less than desirable hook, I'm going to be throwing it away. Um, if, it's, if it's got a bad point, if it's got rust, if it's a bent hook, um, if it's a super small eye that could suggest an older style, I'll probably throw all those ones away. If it's a decent hook, especially if it's a jig hook, if it's already got a bead on it, um, then I'll, I will cut those down with a razor blade. Um, I'll retie them after I verify that the hook is still decent um, or if I can sharpen the hook because I do keep hook sharpeners at my bench. And if it is one that I'm going to retie, I'll sharpen it first to make sure that that hook is going to really come to a nice point. If so, and if it's still got a significant point on it, then I'll, I'll cut everything off and retie at that point. So I hope that kind of makes sense, Tom, but, but I, can, I feel you, I know exactly where you're coming from. It's so time consuming um, and you really just have to figure out how can you best spend your time. I love the tie, but as I typically say, I really, really love the fish. So if it comes down to you know, taking apart old flies or going out fly fishing, you know my answer every time. Let's continue on. The next one is from DJ, like the name. DJ asks, what's your favorite vice? Well, you spelled vice V-I-C-E. So my favorite two vices, probably fly fishing and coffee. I love them both way too much. But I'm guessing you meant vice spelled V-I-S-E. I am a teacher, come on, that's what I do. So um, my favorite vice varies. I will tell you that my first vice was, I don't even know the name brand of it. I still have it, I love it. Um, I, I still will pull it out occasionally to tie some flies on. Um, it didn't have a rotary feature. That was one of the reasons I didn't want it anymore. From that point, I kind of upgraded. I got a used vise from a mentor of mine. Um, it was an Orvis vise. It was a really nice vise. It had a rotary feature, but it really wasn't rotary like on, on a straight plane. So I liked it, but then once I saved up enough money, um, one of my first vices that I had that was just my high-end vise, and it still is to this day, was a Renzetti Traveler. Um, I love the vise. I just love the, the notion of having it a rotary style vise. It was very easy to use. It still is very easy to use. Had a very nice head. Um, there were very few things that ever needed replaced on that Renzetti, except for a little rubber gasket. Um, I think in some of the, the last few videos that I recorded on YouTube with that vise, that gasket, it really wasn't working that well. People would comment, Tim, you really need to replace that. I didn't, and it still worked really well. So the Renzetti Traveler, bulletproof vise, um, by all means, go out, check that one out. From that point, I got a Stonfo Cayman, and I said, this is the last vise that I'm going to use for the rest of my life, and I loved it. And then Stonfo came out with a vice called the Stonfo Transformer. I've done reviews of both of those, the Cayman and the Transformer. Um, the Transformer is definitely my current go-to vice. I've since purchased some other Renzettis, I've tied on the Norvice, and a couple other styles. 
Um, but the transformer is the one I just, it's kind of my go-to. What's really great about that, and you, you can watch the video, but the heads come off. That's why it's called a transformer. So you can take it from a small trout head to one that's for streamers to one that's for tube flies. And it's very smooth. I've had very few issues with it. Now I did say once the transformer came out, that was the, the last vice I would ever tie on. But then I've started to sneak back to my Stonfo Cayman. So depending on where I am in the house, I have my Cayman set up in one spot and I have my, um, my Stonfo transformer in another spot. I love the two of those. If I had to just say one, right now I love the transformer. Now, kind of to help answer that question, I really do want to say that the flies that I tie are mainly trout. They're for smallmouth, steelhead, occasional striped bass, um, sometimes articulated streamers. So that's why I've kind of gone down the path of those vices that, that I just listed. There are lots of options today in the world of vices. Once you kind of hit that $100 threshold um, and from the next tier up, that typically provides a, a vice that will last for more flies than most of us can tie. We're, we're very fortunate in today's world that we have all these options to really phenomenal vices. Um, so probably like a lot of you out there, one of my first vices was a little kit. I think it was from Cabela's. It was like a little wooden box that opened up. The vice in that one was not that great, but at least I got a bunch of the tools for around, I think 25 or $30 at the time. And for one of my fly tying classes that I teach with students, I still will buy those just because it's great to get all the those tools and a vice kind of in a one for all not a great quality vice by any means but it's nice though because if you think you're gonna be into fly tying you're gonna stick with it for a while from that point the upgrades as long as you're willing to spend a little bit more than a hundred dollars there are so many great options out there um, as I love to say if you ask I don't know 15 people about their favorite vice you're probably gonna get 20 different answers because it's just based on what they tie on so if you can go to a shop and at least check out some of the vices there that may help your decision as well uh, I'm gonna ask if there's anyone out there that wants to share your favorite vice mention it down below um, but when people ask me it's tough for me to comment on a lot of other vices because I've really stuck with those ones that I've mentioned and those are the ones that I felt the most comfortable with and the ones that I'm absolutely willing and to, to kind of share and encourage others to at least examine and consider for their own purchase. So uh, DJ, I hope that helps. If you do decide on a vice, um, by all means, let me know which one you, you decide on and after you've tied on it for you know two or three months, let me know what you think of it. Let's continue on. We have some more great questions related to that last one about vices. Um, I did talk about having some review videos of those vices out there and I will list those review videos down below in the description of this one. So there are some video links out there. So if you're driving right now, listening to this kind of like a podcast, uh, don't worry about it. You will find links down below in the description. Continuing on, I got a question from Harley Man DK. What are the fishing rules and regulations on stuff like barbless hooks and fishing licenses for us non-US citizens? This is an EU citizen. I ask because I want to drive from New York to the Ken Lockwood Gorge this summer and fly fish after I've done some work in New York. Um, first of all, um, Harley Man DK, it sounds like you're going to have a lot of fun and it's very you know smart that you're looking at this stuff ahead of time. So what I'll tell you is I don't want to give you the current regulations because those regulations could always change. So what I would recommend do is whenever it's getting close to your trip, call a local fly shop in the area. So just type in where you're going to be fishing in New York, maybe go onto Google Maps, from there type in fly shop and see if there's any fly shops in that area and call that local fly shop because they will be able to give you the up-to-date regulations and regulations can be different from state to state. So it's really good to do your homework ahead of time. So good luck and I hope you have just a really great trip while you're out there. You're gonna love it in that area. All right, we'll move on. This one's from Fuji uh, Hasegawa. And I apologize if I'm butchering that at all. Hi, Tim. I'm new to fly tying and have learned a lot from your videos. Thanks. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, any tips or techniques for tying small flies? Sizes 16 and smaller. Thank you. Great question. I love small flies. Um, someone that I love to, to kind of watch tie small flies is a gentleman by the name of Ed Engel. Um, he ties some small ones. I believe he's got a book out there on tying small flies. So check out that first of all, if you're interested in reading a book because uh, that might be a great kind of avenue to go. Um, and I've mentioned before, someone that I love to watch on Instagram with small flies is Pat Dorsey. I think his Instagram is Pat Dorsey Fly Fishing. Um, check it out, you'll see some really cool small flies. But for me, um, I love to tie small ones. I'm not sure how small you wanna go, Number one, repetition helps. Just to kind of get that dexterity and just to kind of get your hands working with one another and get used to just 
you know, just getting the feel for those smaller, not necessarily smaller materials, but smaller clumps of material. So that repetition helps. Um, number one though, have a powerful light. Um, I have a, a fly tying light that has two LEDs shining down. So the brighter, the better. If you get more light in there, it will allow you to see. Um, also, if you have the opportunity to have a magnifier or the need for a magnifier or those cheater glasses, by all means, get them. Um, I'll use a, a magnifier occasionally, not so often, um, but whenever I use my macro lens to take photos afterwards and I see some like really, really obvious mistakes, it can be upsetting sometimes. So kind of go down that realm. I don't wear cheaters or anything yet. My eyes are exceptional for now. Last time I visited my opt op optometrist, he kind of gave me a peek into the future. I don't like that, but that could be something as well that will help out. Um, if you're going to be tying dry flies, even in kind of medium sizes, Sometimes you can opt for hooks that have a big eye. I think of a hook called the Daiichi 1110. That could be something else that's nice, not necessarily for the tying aspect, but for getting your tippet into the eye afterwards. Um, next, use fewer materials. And by that I mean try to pick, I don't want to call them simpler guide flies, but try not to cram so much stuff onto that small hook. And then most importantly, whenever you are putting materials onto the hook, watch your proportions. Because if you're off by, gosh, just we'll say like a, a half of a millimeter, if you're off by just a tiny, tiny portion on a larger fly, being off by that amount really is meaningless. But being off by a very minute amount on a smaller fly could be by being off by 20 or 25 percent. And that really could just kind of change the proportions on that fly. So really just be very intentional whenever you're tying it. If you have a picture or something Something that you can use that you can set next to your your bench as you're tying to at least say I want my fly to look like this and as you're tying just pause every now and then and just look up and say is it coming out like that or not and if it's not then kind of go back to the, the the drawing board and try to figure out where you've made that mistake jump onto YouTube see if there's a video out there related to that fly and that may kind of help you get to the promised land of tying small dry flies so uh, good luck with that um, you're gonna love it. And I say dry flies there, you're probably tying just a variety of midges and dry flies and emergers and all kinds of stuff. So um, have fun with it because fishing those ones can be a blast too. Good luck. Here we go, some more great questions. Um, this one is from a Nap Flan Clan. Hi Tim, brand new to tying. Welcome, we've got a lot of brand new tires. You're gonna be addicted just like the rest of us. My question relates to tying and hackles. Specifically, I'm starting with woolly buggers. How do I determine hackle to hook size? In other words, how much distance between the hook shaft and the hackle tip should be there for let's say a size eight streamer hook? Is there a method to determine this or a rule of, th a rule of thumb? Also, should the hackle length, shaft to tip again, be of the same size front to back or should it taper? Some videos appear to have it taper, others not so much. Doesn't matter. Anyway, you have a really great site. I started fly fishing when I was in high school many, many years ago, um, and I am now getting back into it. Really love the very nice videos that you and others in the tying world are putting out. Very helpful, Mark. Uh, Mark, thank you for the kind words, and I agree. There are so many great videos out there. Um, there are so many fly tying instructors that I now watch on YouTube, and you're right. There are some great ones that really just can teach us so much more now than even 10 or even seven years ago, it seems like. So now with that said, let me get to your, your uh, questions related to bully buggers, which are a fantastic pattern. The general rule that a lot of people follow is that you want those feathers going twice the hook gap distance. So if you kind of look at it as you have the shank of the hook to, and you have that gap in there down to the point, you want it about twice as far as that as you go from, again, the hook down to the tip of the feather. So twice that distance. So imagine that going up both ways. That's just a general rule. Um, you can have it as little as you want or as long as you want. My personal flies, I tend to have it a little bit shorter than that. Does it matter? Not so much. It's kind of personal preference. And it was funny, um, after one of the fly fishing shows, I was kind of sitting around with some of the other fly fishermen that were giving presentations during the show. And the notion of this exact question came up. And it was very funny because pretty much everybody gave a different answer as to the length that they preferred. So it's very comical to know that there's all these individuals fly fishing all around the country and they all have different lengths. So it doesn't matter. Probably not so much. 
the one thing that if, if you are kind of cognizant, it is kind of nice to at least look in your box and it looks like they all kind of line up and all the proportions are correct. So I would kind of at least recommend if you're going to tie it at a certain length, try to maintain that. The one thing that I'll notice as it gets kind of longer than that, I just don't prefer it really super long. It just kind of takes on a look that I don't like so much. But again, that's just personal preference to me. The better question that you asked it relates to the heckle length regarding should it taper or should it be straight or you know how should it be whenever you're, you're tying it in? And that's a really good question because whenever I was kind of new to the world of fly tying, I would want to look at my saddle hackle because those are the feathers that I use for woolly buggers. And I would kind of cut off that web at the bottom because I would want a uniform piece. So whenever I tied it in, it would be uniform the whole way up. I have since changed dramatically from that. And my personal preference, if I was going to have a taper, I kind of want a reverse taper. So it almost looks like it has a fatter head up by the hook eye. So I tend to tie, this is my current tying, I'll tie my saddle hackle in by the tip at the rear of the woolly bugger. And as I wind forward, my hackles will kind of grow in size to the point where if, if at all possible, I can get it to end. And whenever I go to tie it in or I make the, that final wrap or two at the front, there's almost that fuzziness around the feather. I want that fuzziness with almost marabou at the head as it kind of goes back over the fly. So that's kind of the look that I love to go for. for. Um, the other suggestion that I'll give you, instead of just using what we call woolly bugger hackle, I love this stuff called schlopping. Now schlopping can sometimes be found on certain feathers or certain, certain hackle kind of around the edges. And it's kind of a webbier and it's, it's kind of like, I'm not even sure how to describe it, but it almost looks like hackle that's kind of overgrown in a sense and it's really dense. And that's the hackle that I really tend to prefer. So if it all means you can get schlopping in that right size, go for it, um, you'll love it. I have a video and I'll put a link down below to a schlopping bugger. Um, so check that out and I hope that kind of helps to answer your question, Mark. But again, don't worry about it so much. Tie what, what, what looks good to you and see if the fish respond to it. If they do, you're gonna be doing fine. And once again, welcome to this addicting or addictive world of fly tying. We'll go on to the next question. This is from David Velo. Um, I really like to know the secret to tying wings on wet flies. I just have a hard time getting them to lay down correctly. David, great question for you and everybody else. This can be a really tough one to explain. I'll put a video link down below in the description of this video that shows me tying um, a wet fly wing. Um, whenever I think about wet fly wings, what I, I try to do, I try to match the wings. So whenever I'm grabbing feathers, maybe I have, let's just say I'm using duck. I'll pull one feather from one side of the wing, another matching feather from the other side, and I'm gonna be using a section from each of those. So I wanna make sure I have feathers that um, typically are from duck, though sometimes I'll use them from turkey, from geese, from pheasants, sometimes from other birds. But if I was gonna say start with one, it would probably be a duck for me. Um, I kind of like that dun gray colored feather. From there, I wanna make sure I don't, I, I get enough fibers that it's significant, but not so many that it's too much. Um, you have to be very careful with your thread that if you have too fine a diameter of thread, that it will cut. So there are times, and this could be one of the little tips or tricks that I have for you, if at all you can have it so you can unwind your thread and basically just spin your, um, your bobbin, spin it in a direction that will kind of allow your thread to lay flat. So whenever you wrap it over, imagine you have a really flat piece of thread that kind of just envelops that entire feather or that entire wing after you have it wrapped in. So I will still use something called a pinch wrap. I'm gonna guess you're, you're probably familiar with that. So I'll, I'll place those feathers. I'll have them lined up by their tips in my left hand. I'll place it right on top of that hook shank just to the point where whenever I go up with my thread, I'll lock it between my fingers, come back around, and I'll just kind of pinch it to the point where my, I'm pinching the thread and I'm just, just letting go of the pressure and I'm allowing that thread to just basically kind of cover and pinch those two fibers down on top of the hook, the hook shank. Whenever I'm thinking about um, tying in those, those feathers as a dry fly, I tend to let them kind of go on the sides of the hook shank. But whenever I'm tying it as a wet fly, I like them to go right on top of that hook shank. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, I'm related to that question. Um, I think a previous question kind of talked about hook or talked about small flies. So in this case, I'm thinking about like using a six aught thread for these wet flies, sometimes eight aught, but don't be, don't hesitate to go with a larger style thread to kind of, kind of help things out. 
whenever I previously answered a question related to smaller flies, the one thing I forgot to mention to that is you want to go with a very fine thread. Like you can get away with 12 watt. There's even 16 knot threads now. By using those fine threads, they're a lot more resilient. They're a lot tougher. You can tie those smaller flies. But in this case, you probably want to stay away from that because sometimes those those more those thinner diameter threads will just cut through those wings. Um, if you, David, that's a, again that was a great question. If you have something specifically that you are having trouble with, let me know. Shoot me an email or something that if you notice this was what's always been going on, let me know that specific instance and maybe I can help you even more. But again, thank you so much for that question. All right, we are finally on to the last page of Q&A questions. This next one is from L Dude Rooney. Hi Tim and happy new year to you dude. Happy new year to you as well. For my query, I'm still newbieing after a couple of years, not 24 seven, trying to tie. The thing I have most trouble with is getting that noodle of material for my dubbing. It just refuses to firm up so I can get it going. I do appreciate there are differing densities of noodle for different flies, but ah, LOL. Is there a special technique to it? Um, so first of all, El Dude Rooney, I know exactly what you mean. It can be so frustrating whenever it comes to creating that perfect double dubbing noodle. And yeah, you're right. There are differing densities. For instance, if I'm placing a thorax onto a nymph, I probably want it to be a little buggier and it's okay if it doesn't noodle super tight. But uh, let me give you some suggestions. First, less is more. Whenever you initially place your dubbing on your thread, take like 70% of that dubbing off and try it with that amount. Start the noodle again. That will probably help you because right off the bat, whenever I see a lot of people just putting dubbing on, they put so much on. And I can tell you, um, I, I go through a lot of dubbing, but a dubbing pack really does last me a very significant portion of time. So if you feel like you're putting on just even a, a little bit too much, that's going to mess up your, your noodle. The next thing that I'll suggest is make sure that you're going in the same direction whenever you're creating your, your noodle. And what I mean by that, my fingers, they're either going clockwise or counterclockwise. But whenever I'm creating that noodle, it's not back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It's just clockwise, clockwise, clockwise. And I'm just constantly using that same motion on my thread. Now, if you go to ask me which way do I prefer to go, it really varies. And it's interesting because I teach a lot of fly tying classes for children at my school. And whenever I watch them dub, I have a lot of students that will go, they'll dub clockwise and everything works. And I have a lot of students that will go counterclockwise. And if you talk to different tires, it shouldn't work like that, but it does. Except when you go clockwise counter, clockwise counter, then you're, you're kind of just wrapping and unwrapping. And that could be something that you're having problems with. Also, what material are you using? Because I can tell you, if you're going to use natural fibers, they will create a much easier dubbing noodle. We're talking like rabbit. I mean, it's just that, that, that natural material for me anyway, is so much easier to dub than synthetics. Now there are some, some easy to dub synthetics out there, but on average, if I'm going to go with something that's got a lot of flash and it's very crinkly, it can be just an absolute pain in the butt to get onto my thread. So kind of look at the material materials you're using and see if that can kind of be a kind of not a cause for concern, but just to say, maybe that's causing the problem. And if so, one recommendation that I have is you can use a touch of wax. So you can buy these, these different, we'll say dubbing waxes, and you'll just put them on your thread very lightly. Then you can almost take the dubbing and just kind of touch it to your thread with that wax and that wax will grab it. And then you can create your noodle down your thread from there. There are a couple different waxes out there. Down below in the description of this video, I'll put some links to Competitive Angler. There's two that I would recommend. One is from Hens, H-E-N-D-S, it's their dubbing wax. And another is called the Loon High Tax Swax, dubbing wax, I believe. So those are two options. Um, hopefully that, that those, those will help or those tips will kind of help you get started a little bit um, because there's so many different flies that I still dub to this day. Now there's other methods around that, including splitting your thread or using um, this, this other technique that involves a, a tool and you create a dubbing loop, which I love to do as well. But if you're trying to get that really tight body, yeah, it comes down to that noodle. And I guarantee if you keep at it, you will get it. Now I do want to mention if there's other people out there that have had a similar problem over the years tying and you have a solution to it, um, by all means mention it down below in the comment section to help answer this question and maybe to help others out there too.
And then on to our last question. This is from Lucas Lohngren. Uh, Lucas asks, I would love to see tips and tricks on feathers. Thank you for all the great info you provide. Well, first of all, thank you, Lucas. I really appreciate um, those kind words. You ask about tips and tricks on feathers. Do you have any specific feathers you're interested in? If so, shoot me an email. My email address is tcamisa at gmail.com. That's in the description of this video. Um, I already have a couple of videos out there and I'll put links to them and they give some tips. I have a video on Hungarian partridge. Whenever I tie soft tackle flies, um, one of the biggest tips I tell to people is as I'm looking at the feather, I strip away one half of the fibers, basically the left side of the front of the feather, and then I tie it in by the tip and that gives me a very sparse soft tackle. Um, I also have a video on hen hackle and I talk about tips and some other tricks there. And then I do have um, some videos related to hackle in general um, on buying hackle or selecting hackle. So maybe those videos will help. Um, but you're also asking um, what's a tip or a trick with a feather. Um, I can tell you whenever I watch my great uncle John tie flies, something that he is constantly doing is using either saliva or he has a little bowl that he keeps with water at his tying desk. And as he's tying with certain materials like marabou or CDC, once they get locked in, he'll wet them and kind of allow that, 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 that wetness will just allow, allow you the ability to move them out of your way to then make sure they won't interfere with the other fibers and the other materials you're placing on your hook. So that's something that I picked up from him over the years and I am constantly just, just applying some form of water to my fly just to kind of manipulate those, those feathers and move them around so I have access to the other areas of the hook. So um, Lucas, I hope that helps. And if there's anyone else out there that has any tips or tricks, uh, again, please mention them down below in the comment section. And with that said, I think I'm back to page one of all of these great questions that all of you sent. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to ask questions. Um, hopefully what I said made sense. If there's something that you weren't, weren't quite sure about, you can mention it down below in the comment section of this, or you can email me at tcamisa at gmail.com. And as always, if there's something you'd like to add as well, just to help others, please do so. I look forward to all of you just continuing the conversation on this video and on many of my other ones. Speaking of those other videos, you'll find them housed at my website, troutandfeather.com. I'm talking about videos like this Q&A one, techniques, guest tires, flies, basically whatever you're looking for, I probably have it over there. Once you get the Trout and Feather, if you scroll down to the bottom of those pages, you'll find an email sign up. And I'd love to have you added to my email list. Basically every month, month and a half, I send out an email related to video updates, fly fishing and tying tips, tricks, pictures, just a little bit of odds and ends stuff and events too. So again, I'd love to have you sign up to that. If you're into social media, you can find Trout and Feather on both Instagram and Facebook. And a big shout out to all of those that are just sharing my videos via Facebook. It really means the world to me to know that you find my videos informative and valuable enough to share with all of your friends. So thank you. And anytime you do that, please tag me just so I know that they are being shared out there. And a big thank you to everybody who sent in a question that I shared on YouTube. Hopefully you're YouTube famous for like 30 seconds at least and you can share that with some of your friends as well. But thanks so much. Again, I hope my answers made sense and to all of you watching, I truly appreciate it and I'll see all of you next time.